Um, All right, so we are joined from New York City by the Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at Columbia University, Ivy League institution, uh, <laughs> Dr. Raquel Gates. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us. We've got a room full here with us at Velma Jackson High School. It's our college and career readiness class. We're recording this for all of our friends in Madison County Schools, Madison Central High School, Ridgeland High School, Germantown High School, the Academic Options Center, and our YouTube channel. And we also have a couple of our administrative staff online with us here as well. So we thank you so much for uh, starting Black History Month off with us today. Yeah, it's I, I didn't realize when we um, originally set the date that it would be um, it would coincide with kicking off Black History Month, but what a what a what a nice uh, sort of way that things come together. Yeah. Now, before we get into um, all the things that you do, and obviously we want to talk about double negative as well, um, give us a little background on your education because I'll put your resume up against anybody we've ever had, and we've had over four hundred guests. Um, <laughs> Northtown University, University yeah. of Chicago, Northwestern University, and now at Columbia University. What wow, what a sure. resume! So, tell us a little bit about the about that educational journey because we have kids getting ready to make their own college choices. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm originally, uh, so I'm I'm zooming in from Brooklyn, uh, but I'm originally from Chicago um, and grew up on the south side of Chicago. And um, yeah, I went to Georgetown um, University for undergrad, um, majoring in international relations, because uh, I thought that's what I wanted to do, um, not having any clue what international relations actually meant, which is kind of the problem of picking a major when you're 18 and not really knowing a whole lot about how anything works. So <laughs> that, that happened. Um, when I was a senior, um, I took an elective, um, which was a TV studies course. I just took it because it fit my schedule, quite, quite frankly, um, and I loved it. And I realized in that class that there had been a lot of like ideas and things I was passionate about that had been kind of like percolating uh, for a long time that kind of came together in that class. So um, yeah, the, the problem is that when you graduate from college and you suddenly decide you want to do something that's radically different than what your major is, you're 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 like you're kind of in trouble. So um, yeah. I did. A, yeah, I went I mean, I went back home to Chicago. I did a master's degree at University of Chicago. And then um, if you want to go into academia, like as a professor, you have to get a Ph.D. Um, so I did my Ph.D. at Northwestern. Um, I actually started teaching. I've taught at a bunch of different places, but I taught for 10 years at the College of Staten Island, um, yeah. which uh, which I mentioned because the student population um, at CSI is, is, was really different than the student population at Columbia. Um, a lot of the kids at CSI were uh, like me, the first in their families to go to college. Wow. Um, a lot. A lot of my students at CSI um, were balancing like work and family obligations. Some of them were older. They had kids. They had families of their own. Um, while they were trying to go to school, you know, and get their degree. Um, and so I was at, I was there for about 10 years. And this is, uh, I think, my third year um, at, at Columbia. So I also have some thoughts, quite frankly, on, um, you know, just sort of what these what colleges are like um, and some of the, yeah. the misconceptions, I think, that folks might have um, about what different types of colleges and student bodies are like. Yeah, and, and in Mississippi here, we have some great HBCUs, both private and public, and we're a big mm -hmm. supporter of those. Having kids really find their their perfect fit for college. Um, you know, they obviously offer different things. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, PWIs offer things HBCUs can't. HBCU thing offers things PWIs can't. So we yeah. have a lot of people that do both, and I think that's great. So I think it's really important. We actually have a couple of HBCU community colleges in Mississippi as yeah. well. So it really is a lot of college experience from that. Um, but I'm obviously, a, I'm a very, my cousins, a bunch of my cousins went to Jackson State. So I'm a very big fan like of, of Jackson well, State. And I'll also say, I mean, there's, there's HBCUs and there's PWIs, but there's also a whole range of colleges that aren't don't really fall into those classifications that like we call them like minority serving institutions. So they're not technically yeah. HBCUs, but they're they're radically more diverse than like most like PWIs. So, yeah, Georgia State and Atlanta is a great example yeah. of that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but obviously, uh, well, the main reason we have you here today, uh, I I saw you on the uh, documentary uh, Stamp from the Beginning on Netflix, which I recommend everybody to watch. Very thought provoking. You know, you've been on E, e Entertainment Television talking about Jersey Shore. You've been on Turner Classic Movies, been on uh, several radio shows, several uh, guest appearances in the New York area and all all over the country. Um, and something that, uh, you know, we were talking about before we went to lunch and just came back that, you know, the way that the black race has been portrayed in media and the way they're portrayed now in media is so thought provoking. And it really is uh, a, a way that people are perceived. And we are a all black community here in rural Mississippi. And we have, I'll put these kids up against anybody 
But at the same time, they're still very sheltered and really don't have an idea of what is awaiting them when they get outside of these four walls. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you wrote the book Double Negative as well, which I, I, I like I said, I had an opportunity to read uh, part of it last night and really, really enjoyed it. Very thought provoking to get some different thoughts about things. So um, tell us about, you know, what it is you that you talk about in your classes at Columbia and what's kind of led to you really having this platform to talk about this very, very important issue. Mm -hmm. So um, what I teach at Columbia, I mean, I, I teach a range of courses and I'm in the film department. So some of the stuff that I teach are like basic level, like introduction to film um, and like media theory and media history and things like that. And then within my research specialty. So in general, college professors, they teach kind of the, the core requirements in the department. Um, and then you teach stuff in your specialty. So my two main areas of specialty are black film and TV, like sort of black popular culture, and then reality television. That's my other like area of specialty. So like this semester, um, I'm teaching a black film and media studies class and I'm teaching a reality TV class. Um, and there's there's obviously like overlap. So um, I, what I try to do in my classes um, is I try to challenge students to be able to hold like multiple truths in mind at one time. Absolutely, and so absolutely. You're talking about black representation um if you're if you're like kind of going through kind of the history of just like american film and television um there there is no question that um black folks have been portrayed um in some of the most like just debasing stereotypical ways as being you know like being lazy uh being aggressive being hypersexualized being dim-witted and so on and so forth so one of the things that i do in my classes is I try to uh, teach students the history of those representations, but then also how those representations and those stereotypes have been coded in maybe less obvious ways. So things you might not sort of think about as being sort of, you know, debasing, but, but, but are when you kind of like scratch the surface. So that's one thing that I do. And a lot of that involves, you know, kind of tracing historical media, like, you know, the origins of film go all the way back to 1895, roughly. Yeah. 1895 to, to present. Yeah. So we talk about that, um, talk about what kinds of, you know, tropes and things like that have endured. Um, but then the other thing that I also try to do um, is, you know, there's also another story of American film and television, which has been Black people resisting these types um, and um, offering different types of representations. And also Black audiences, quite frankly, um, sort of having the agency to reinterpret things along their own lines. I mean, I think that's really powerful and that's a story that doesn't often get told. Um, just that, you know, people watching films and TV, they're not just passive recipients, but they really are, you know, kind of, um, they're like almost mentally editing out the stuff they don't want, you know, and focusing on the things um, that, that they do and that they find sort of culturally resonant. So those are the things I try to do in my classes. Um, in terms of the the platforms, um, you know, there's not like a track for exactly for exactly for, for being on television for, and stuff like that. Um, but um, I think a thing that I've always done in my in my research is I I talk about popular culture in a serious and multi layered way. So I I don't think anything should be dismissed. Um, I think that everything is relevant um, and important um, and like. Frankly, I'd say early in my academic career that that didn't always find um, that wasn't always a position that was respected <laughs> or, um, you know, um, it had a lot of credibility. So, you know, like some early publications like I've, I've published stuff on Basketball Wives and like Love and Hip Hop was like my show for a long, long time. Um, Jersey Shore, obviously. Um, it, it, <laughs> folks haven't always respected that within the academy. I mean, that's changing now. Um but I, I I like to think that one of the things that that I I do well is I'm able to talk about, um you know popular culture. I like to talk about kind of popular culture in a way that's serious and rigorous. Um, but I feel like I'm also able to with my with my students talk about like old stuff in a way that makes it seem new and fresh. And I feel like that's something um yeah. that that I'm pretty good at. Um, and that tends to translate well into like television appearances. Absolutely, and and you mentioned something there about you know. Everything is relevant. You know, it's well known. Mm -hmm. Hattie McDaniel was the first African-American to win an Oscar in 1939 or 40. But she mm -hmm. won that Oscar for playing a slave in Gone with the Wind. So yeah. even when, even yeah. though that was groundbreaking and a great achievement on her part, she was seen as somebody that could play a good uh, a, a good slave. And then you yeah, talked about I mean, 
thesis yeah. about how it what really wasn't an even until the 90s where you saw black actors in roles that weren't racially charged, racially racially mm-hmm. stereotyped that had leading that had leading person uh characteristics. Yeah, I mean it's complicated too because I mean Hattie McDaniel is um and if you've seen Gone with the Wind, I mean Hattie McDaniel is doing the absolute most with, you know, with a part that is that is on paper um you know at least in the script is a fairly you know kind of like it's just it's a trope um so you know what i said earlier about trying to hold multiple truths in in mind like the character is written on the page is kind of a racist stereotype but i would argue that what hattie mcdaniel does with that character um is something completely different and that that's sort of her power i mean there's a a a scene and i'll send y'all a link but you can like uh, there's a great scene in gone with the wind where um um Vivian Lee who's like like you know the mistress of the plantation is she she's getting dressed and she's about to go to barbecue and she's like going so she can go flirt with this dude who's not interested in her whatsoever um and Hattie McDaniel is is like her caretaker and she's trying to get her ready and trying to get her to eat something and there's this great moment where like Hattie McDaniel's character kind of calls her out and she just gives her this look it is just it is just shade and side eye and I always play this clip for my classes because I say like there's no way that the white director told Hattie McDaniel to do that. He, it's yeah. not in his cultural lexicon to like have her do that. That's her. That's all her. And if you watch it, you, I mean, I always ask my students, who in your life has given you that look? And people are like, yeah, <laughs> my mother looks at me like my grandma looks at me like that. And it's a testament to like what an amazing performer she was, right? But then there's also the story, not just that she plays a slave, but that she wasn't invited to the premiere because like, because the premiere- I forgot was about that, yeah. Theater. like she couldn't she couldn't be there um she when she if you you can find this on youtube you can look up her acceptance ex- speech um at the academy awards and there's this long walk for her like they you know like the the, the nominees are supposed to sit in the front so they can get to the stage really quickly if they win it takes her forever to get to the stage because she was seated in the back of the theater with like the bus boys and the server so she's got to like walk all the way from the back to the front and when she gets up there um you know, she gives this amazing speech and, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing, you, y'all can just find it on your own, but she's like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for my people. Like I, I, I want, you know, I'm doing this so that black people will be proud of me. I'm doing this for us. Right. Um, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Right. All of those things are kind of happening in that moment. Yeah. And, and something else, you, uh, something else you mentioned, and you, you talk about this in your book as well, uh, double negative, and we'll, we'll tell us where everybody can get that later, but you mentioned something that I had never thought about. You said that for a black cast in movie, black directed movie, uh, mm-hmm. the way it seems and the way it is perceived is that in order for it to really make a lot of money and appeal to a broad audience, it has to kind of appease to the white viewers. A yeah. white movie doesn't necessarily have to do that to the black viewers. So there is an obvious double standard in media that is yeah. there and is it and it's, it's pretty much proven in if you look at the box office returns on a lot of these movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the tells is when you hear, especially like executives and and people saying, um, um, well, will people go to see this movie? And I, and the thing I always say to my students, is like, who do we mean when we say people, right? Like they, they're always talking about white audiences. And I I think what's, um, what's complicated. So a lot of times the pushback that black cast films get, it's by studio executives. It's by white studio executives who think that there isn't a market and, Historically, we know there is a market. Like in the 70s, black films save Hollywood. Like they do. Like Hollywood has no money. The country's in a depression. Um, and they kind of invest in all of these like black films and like they save Hollywood. So the receipts don't really add up. This is just kind of a, a misperception um that, you know, that that why demographics of people don't go see black movies. They do, and they sell well globally um, as well. But that's, it's a mis, it's a, a misperception. And even, um, you know, when black films do well, you can see this in like production notes, studio executives still think they're failures. It's almost like a, like a white film, like The Hangover or something, it can do okay, and it'll get a sequel. A black film can do better and will still be deemed a failure. It's like they have to overperform at the box office um, but because a lot of executives assume that they won't do well, they also undermarket them or they don't distribute them globally. So it becomes like this self-fulfilling prophecy, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think Moonlight is a great example of that, you know, it wins best picture, but you really didn't see a whole lot of uh, ad campaign for that, as you would see in some of the, like you mentioned, like yeah. a movie like The Hangover. And obviously I'm a fan of both, but that's yeah. a very valid point that, you know, it, it really wasn't marketed 
in a, in a, a greater sense as some of the other movies were. But Moonlight. I mean, what's tricky about Moonlight is Moonlight. I would argue was deliberately not marketed as a, as a black movie. Um, it was. It, if you look at the trailer, yeah. it looked like an art house movie. Um, I have to see where it played. Um, but. To me, it's an it's another form of discrimination because it's almost like that studio didn't believe that just like regular black folks would go see that movie. So they didn't market it that way, you know, wow. and they were also worried about it being associated with a black film. Um, <laughs> you know, like a white film is considered universal, but a black film is considered niche. Right. Um, and that's that's yeah. the problem. Because you, you absolutely. One hundred percent agree. If people can find their way into Goodfellas, like I love Goodfellas. Right. But if if I can identify with this community of folks that like, you know, I don't know real life mafiosos that, that I know of, I don't know. Um, but ultimately if I can identify with the humanity of that story, obviously white people can identify with the humanity of black stories as culturally specific as they might be, right? And to me, it's actually, um, it's, it's insulting audiences, black, white and everything in between um, to say that they can't do that or they can't be expected to do that. Yeah. Now, something else I want to talk about, and I heard you speak on this on one of your pieces, and I thought this was a great point. You know, I grew up in a household that made parenting decisions based on the Huxtables. And oh. Cosby was obviously groundbreaking for several yeah. reasons, not only with the uh, all black cast. They had a lot of black writers, black uh, crew that went on to work on other uh, other shows that really got black writers into the business. Um, but something you mentioned, and this is a great point. You said even though he was uh, Theo uh, Heathcliff Huxtable was a great positive representation, that is mm -hmm. not the only positive representation of black people that can be made in media. And that is yeah. a, a to me a very valid point. I mean, I you know, part of this is, um, I mean, it's also important to contextualize the Cosby show. Like Cosby doesn't come out of nowhere. Cos the Cosby show is also reacting to um, other shows um, that some critics thought were like negative representation. I'm always gonna put that in quotes because I, I just think there's no objective way to discern what, when something is quote unquote positive or negative. Um, people deem the Cosby show a positive representation because the family was like upper middle class. Uh, it was a, it was a, a heterosexual, like married couple, like there was a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I get a little uncomfortable with that because um, to me, it's like saying that if you have a single mother headed household, there's something wrong with that. When I would say like, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, and that's like why I'm always putting positive in quotes, negative in quotes. Um, but the other thing too, is I think there's, there's more than one way to, to be, you know, whether like in real life, television. And so for me growing up, um, like I watched the Cosby show obsessively. I also hated the Cosby show because their lifestyle just felt so inaccessible to me. Like they lived in this gorgeous brownstone, like, you know, my, like, I don't think we had a, I lived in, I lived in an apartment. They, we didn't have a, a proper dining table, like kitchen table. So I was like 10, eight, 10 or something. My dad worked a night shift. My mom worked a day shift. We never sat down at the dinner table the way the Huxtables did. So for me, that, that wasn't anything that was relatable to me. You know what I mean? Um, and I think what the hope is with representation, um, especially for, for, for like representations of blackness is not to get the right one, but to have a bunch of different representations of different types of families, different types of people, right? That show people in their humanity, not just at their best. Because frankly, I think that I think that's kind of boring. Absolutely. And 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 that was such a great point that I had never thought about. And I'm I'm glad that it's being talked about because you know, you'll never hear an argument from me that, you know, representation of, of everybody matters in every medium. And there are multiple ways to portray people positively than just the cookie cutter, what, like you said, what people like. And and I, I just thought that was such a great talking point. And I really want these kids to understand that, you know, you can be positive without be, seeing, uh, being what uh, society perceives as positive. Um, and right. it's just, you know, with all these kids getting ready to graduate and making their own decisions and forming their own opinions about things, I, I just think that message cannot be um, cannot be given enough. Um, now, before I get to their questions, I do want to talk about your book, Double Negative. Um, sure. I, I, like I said, I got I got to read a little bit of it last night, and it was very captivating. You know, um, and and I you know I, I tell these kids all the time about find things that can make you think. You know, I I you know obviously like you, I like the celebrities too. I like following them on Instagram, and they're they're fun to see mm -hmm. what they're doing. But find find things to make you think. And things mm -hmm. like this, a book like yours, really makes you think about the way the culture is perceived. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Um, so so Double Negative, uh, which was published in 2018, which is kind of crazy to think it was that long ago. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's my and to be clear, it's like an academic book. Right. So it's it serves a particular purpose. Um, so um, 
you know, for me, I, I wanted there to be a more complex way to talk about Black popular culture. I wanted there to be um, a way to talk about like reality television that wasn't just like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> because I, because yeah. all the shows I talk about in, you know, in the book, like I love them. I like, I, I love Real Housewives of Atlanta, you know, um, I love Potomac, but it wasn't out when I was writing the book. Um, I really have an affection for Flavor of Love. And not only, it, it's not just that I like them, so I want to defend them, but I actually think that they're more complicated than people give them credit for being right so like if you take a film like moonlight we can talk all day about why that's complicated and complex and blah 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 um, but when we talk about certain genres we sort of assume there's nothing going on there and i i disagree with that i, I think some of the most interesting um uh, sort of uh discourses about identity and politics and culture are happening in the like trashy spaces of popular culture much more so than like in the in the official ones and I've always thought that so um it was exciting for me to be able to put those ideas you know sort of into writing it was exciting to be able to talk about why I think Cat Williams is brilliant and he's a brilliant theorist not just that he's a funny comedian but I, I think he's a brilliant theorist and so to put him in the introduction of, of the book you know for me kind of set the tone for how I was doing like all of the analysis there yeah and, and you met and you even used uh and you used President Obama in the book as an example yeah. of <laughs> You know, it, it was he was almost like saying he was placating both sides and he wasn't, you know, he was expected to be one way. But uh, and, and I think this is a valid argument. You talked about how it seemed like he was appeasing white people so he would he wouldn't seem too black to the, his yeah. white supporters. I, th I thought that was a valid point. Yeah. And then he's doing it. Um, I, I mean, the other thing is, is, you know, we kind of talk about individuals but we don't talk about them as like media figures too i mean you know there's a shift that happens in this country between when politicians would go and do stump speeches but now they have to be like in front of the camera you know a lot of that changed you know around the time that john f kennedy was elected like the idea of being kind of like a media figure is a thing now right so um for me there isn't as much of a clear separation between politics and television anymore because politicians are media figures Absolutely, more so now than ever. Um, well, yes, but I, I yes. Do have, I do have some questions from the students, and yeah. um, and and I, I told I told them to get I, I told them to really think. So uh, we got some really good ones. Get as many of these as I can. Uh, this first one is Selena Johnson. She's a junior here, right. one of our volleyball players. Or used to be one of our volleyball players. She's done a lot here. Uh, also, a member of our Technology Student Association. Uh, but she asks, "How did you know that what you're doing now was the path you wanted to take in life?" Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I, <laughs> I, I didn't. Um, what I'll say is there's certain things I always kind of came back to um, from high school forward. Like, I, I'm not one of those people who says, when I was five years old, I knew I wanted to be what, like, I didn't know you could be a college professor. I didn't know that was a job. I certainly didn't know you could be a college professor who taught film and television. Like, I, why would I know that? Um, so what I would say is, um, I kept following paths, trajectories that that were interesting to me. So in college, I was an international relations major, but there was a there was a track where you could focus on culture and politics, or you could do international finance. I didn't want to do inter so I did. Oh, I'll do culture and politics, right? Um, I found myself drawn to literature courses and to media courses, and you know, and things like that. Um, um, that eventual that what that does, kind of following the things that really interest you, is it starts to you start to you know there's a fork in the road. You keep sort of making certain turns and you end up at a place. Um, at the, by the, by the time I was finishing my master's degree, it's when I realized, oh, what I want to do is I want to be a scholar of film and media studies at the college level. And at the point where you make that decision, there's only one way you can go, which is to go get a PhD and, and get on the job market. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't until then that I had it kind of locked in. So I I just, you know, as I tell my students, you kind of follow the stuff that you feel an affinity towards, you know, not even the things you're necessarily good at, uh, but the things you have an affinity towards. Um, And also find um like good mentors. Like if you have a teacher, you know, in a subject that you like, you talk to them um, about like potential career paths, um, which is a thing like I did in college, you know, like talking to professors about like, well, what options are there for me? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh this is deep right here. This is RJ Jones. He's a uh, junior here, one of our top students in the school. And he asked, so with all that went on and is currently going on dealing with the culture of African-Americans, what was your biggest motivation to uh, appear in a film like Stint from the Beginning that was so emotional? I mean, so to be fair, it's not like I exactly knew what it was going to be, what it was going to turn out to be when you sign up to do it. Um, so I knew what I knew was that um, 
there was a documentary being developed for Netflix based on Ibram Kendi's book, Stamp from the Beginning. Um, and I've read Stamp from the Beginning. Stamp from the Beginning covers a large, a lot, except a, a huge sort of territory. So to be fair, when I go in to do the interview, what I know is that I'm gonna come in and talk about representations of blackness in, in film and television. That's is, I don't actually have a sense of the rest of how it's all gonna to come together. I didn't know about the animation. I, I, I had no clue about that. Um, and so that's what I went in to do. And, you know, I always, when, when I've, when I get asked to do kind of media appearances, I always ask myself, like, do I think I am, am I uniquely suited to do this particular thing? Sometimes I get asked to do stuff. It's not in my wheelhouse. I don't think I can offer anything that'll be particularly useful. And I turn it down and I recommend somebody else that I know to, to, to do it, you know, um, this is a thing I was like, yeah, I can do this. I, I teach this all the time. I do the history of film. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good with that. Um, I actually didn't know kind of what it was all going to look like until I went to like the New York screening. I, I had no, I, like, I didn't know that all the talking heads were, were going to be black women. I didn't know that. Um, that was amazing when I, when I saw it, but I, I didn't know. And to be honest, um, I always have a little bit of ambivalence with accepting uh, media appearances because you you don't always know how it's going to turn out um, and you you don't know how your stuff is going to get used. And this was one of those that, you know, I kind of went in and was like, I'm just going to do my thing. I don't know what the final thing is going to look like. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and hope that it, um, you know, feels sort of in line with my own kind of way I do stuff. Um, but that was, you know, that was it. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I'll say it again, I, I highly recommend to any, for er, everyone to watch it. Um, very, very eye opening, very, very uh, interesting as well. Some of the facts that were thrown out about, you know, the history of media and the history of the uh, of some of the uh, policies that were made. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I understand these kids are young. It was long before they were born, even their parents were born. But it really did shape the way things were filmed, the way things were printed, the way things were were kind of misconstrued. And it talks about the myths about the yes. black race that perpetuated mm -hmm. on the public that were really, really obvious once you uh, mm -hmm. look. It's a very, very interesting film. And again, I just, I really uh, encourage everyone to take some time to watch it. Uh, here's an interesting question. This is Christian Wolf. He's a senior. And he asked, do you ever get nervous or scared when you know you're about to be on television? Yes. Like, what, <laughs> of course. Like, what, like, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, no. I mean, um, Yes. Um, I always, so I get nervous about a couple of different things. Some of this stuff is just basic vanity stuff. Like you hope you'll look okay on film. You know, I mean, I've, I've done, um, I, when I was on TCM, like two, uh, last year, two years ago, I don't know, time I was in many anymore. Um, I, like I always wear my glasses. I mean, like not necessarily around my neighborhood, but in general, like for professional stuff, I always have on my glasses. Um, and it's, it's like a weird security blanket too, you know? Um, and I remember we went in to shoot and they were like, Oh yeah, you can't wear your glasses. And I was like, wait, wait, what do you mean I can't wear my glasses? Um and it sounds silly, but I it's it's like a thing that kind of throws you off, right? Um, you always you I mean, it's how do you all feel when you like listen to yourself when you've like recorded something? You know what I mean? Like hearing your your voice played back. It's it's weird. Um, point. It, it's weird. <laughs> it's weird seeing yourself where you're like, oh, why did I wear that? Why did I wear this other thing? I mean, so on a surface level, yes, you're always nervous about it. Um but the other thing I'll say too is the thing that makes me the most nervous is you have no editorial control. I've worked with some places like there's a there's a film company called the Criterion Collection, um, and they're great because when you go and you do an interview or you do an introduction, they not always, but I've been very lucky that they'll usually send me like a rough kind of like cut and say like, do you feel good about this? And I'll say, oh that thing I oh that didn't come out the way I wanted to. I sound really snarky or I sound like I'm criticizing this filmmaker. I really didn't mean that. Could, could you know? Could you remove that? Um, but that's rare. You you don't have any idea how they're gonna put your stuff together or like for instance with if you guys see stamped the images that they might they might pair with what you're saying might might be in line with what you were talking about it might not be you don't have any control over that um I, i've done i've you know i've done one or two things where in the interview because you're you're talking to a producer you know someone's asked you questions i've you know i've done one or two things where suddenly the questions start going in a direction where you can tell they have an argument they're trying to make that is completely different than ha than what i actually think about something and they're trying to lead you in a direction and that that gets really uncomfortable because at the end of the day, you're the person who's on camera and on record having said something, right? Um, yeah. I've had, um, I, I did something once where, um, especially around 2020, 2021, as a reality TV scholar, people always want to try to bait 
me into talking about Donald Trump. Um, and Donald Trump is a reality TV star. And I mean, there's been times I've just been like, you're not going to catch me on camera saying, I, I'm not trying to have people like sending me mean emails and everything else. I'm not saying anything about that. Right. Um, so those are the things I tend to get like the most nervous about. Interesting. Uh, now, here's a good question. This is Deja Weaver, uh, senior, uh, one of our volleyball players and part of our digital media academy here on campus. Uh, but she asks, how much do you think inequality has played a, a part in the development of the African-American race? Um. Hmm. OK, I mean, I think that I think that everything and everybody are, are impacted by structures. I think it, I mean, I just think that's that's what it is. And so I think there's no way that inequality does not play a huge role in like in our story. Um, but I don't necessarily view that as just a bad thing. Like I so I think of it like my analogy is soul food. Right. So soul food is about slaves taking scraps from like the master table, like the stuff that like the white people wouldn't eat um, and making an amazing cuisine out of that. To me, that's what black people do. Like we, 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 we take what's not just what's given to us. We, it doesn't matter that we don't get the choicest cuts of meat. We're going, we're going to make it great regardless. And that's sort of how I think about stuff that the story of black people in this country is really one of resilience. It's really one of innovation. Um, and to me, that's a superpower. Um, and so I look at sort of these histories of how black people have responded to systems of horrific inequality and oppression. And I take a lot of pride in what we've done, um, you know, and what we've kind of crafted out of that. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I just got one more. And this is a she's got a two part question. This is Shania Kyles, one of our dancers here at Velma Jackson. And she actually moved here from Minnesota. So a little bit different part of the country. Uh, but this, this is a great question. Um, uh, she asked, first of all, if I wanted to get into the media industry, what would be some tips that you would give me? And mm -hmm. what are some of the hardships you have faced that have shaped you into the person that you are? Oh, okay. Um, if you want to get, so this is tricky because I'm in academia. I'm not in media. Like, so eh, I can't give you the best advice, but what I, what I will say, I teach a lot of like folks who go into the media industry though. Um, I mean, one, I think having a resume that ha is like a collection of skills. I mean, that, that matters, you know, if you want to go and be a screenwriter, you need to like know how to write. Um, looking for programs, like whether it's grad school or an MFA program or something like that, um, that lets you do that um, is important uh, as a credential, but so is getting like experience. So for instance, um, you can be a lot of times like film sets, they need what they call production assistants, like a PA, like people who kind of like do grunt work on sets. The, the point isn't that that's going to like launch you into Hollywood, but you build relationships, you kind of get to be part of a crew on set and you can move from project to project. Um, so that's a thing you can do. Um, finding mentors, finding other people to work with is another thing. Um, I have students who like, they join film clubs and they work with other students on their film projects, you know, and get experience that way. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I would sort of say. Um, looking for like local things too. A lot of people just have Hollywood in mind, but you can look for like, what are the film festivals or film production that's happening locally? I mean, you know, I know that y'all are in Mississippi, but like Atlanta is the, that is the hub right now for film and TV production, yeah. you know? Jackson in the last, Jackson just in the last eight month has, months has filmed four Hollywood movies in town. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, figuring out how you can even, you know, even in independent productions and stuff like that, you know, kind of, um, you know, volunteer to like, you know, work with folks. It's like well, one thing you can do. Um, what are some hardships I faced um, and how have they shaped me? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what hardships, I, I don't know, maybe because we don't uh, perceive hardships the same way. Um, no, I'll say this. I will say it has been, it is hard being in academia when you have no clue how academia works. And, and I say yeah. that because like, uh, like the university system is, it's, nobody tells you how things get done or how you're supposed to do things. Nobody tells you because there's an assumption that you already know. There's an assumption you already know because this is a system that like, the number of university professors whose parents were university professors is astonishing. Like it's not a meritocracy, yeah. you know? Um, I, I mean, I remember one time I, when I was in grad school, I asked, um, I had to like submit a proposal for something and I emailed uh, like my advisor or my, I'm sorry, my professor at the time. And I said, oh, can you tell me like, how long is this proposal supposed to be? And they wrote back and they said, standard proposal length. 
Like, no, I was literally like, how many pages is this? I had no idea what to do, right? Um, but in 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 their mind, they thought everybody knew this. And so, wow. you know, people tell you all the time to ask for help, but you can't ask for help if you don't even know what you don't know. That's been really hard. Um, not understanding how things work, um, having to figure stuff out. Um when you don't feel like you have a whole lot of um, room for failure within this system, that's been hard. Um, the way, I will say the way it has improved me is you realize that you need, I, I tell my students this all the time too, like you have to find your people. Like anywhere you go, you find your people. So for me, it's been finding Black women academics who are mentors, who are friends, who are peers, who they don't have to be at my school. If something's going on at my school, I know who I can call and they'll, they're they're going to tell me, all right, this is what you do when this type of thing happens, right? Um, it's it, it's and and so for me, that has been like absolutely crucial to to my survival and to me, you know, doing well. Um, but it's also it's another one of those things that becomes a superpower because I know that I have a network of people who hold me down, who I hold down, that it's not contingent on what this university gives me. I'll be good wherever I go, you know? Um, yeah. And so that's something that I take with me. And that's also something that I, I try to sort of like, you know, pay back with like junior scholars who are coming up behind me too. Awesome. And we actually have a great uh, radio, television, film degree program at University of Southern Mississippi, just south of here. And we, and like I said, uh, uh, the changing of the state flag in Mississippi was a big deal. So more and more movies are being filmed here. We had a George Lopez movie, a Terrence Howard movie. We had a Mickey Rourke movie. We had a horror movie film recently. So there are more opportunities here. And a lot of that comes from that flag change. That's a whole different conversation. Um, now, <laughs> we're almost out of time, and we thank you so much for taking some time for us. But a couple things before we go. Uh, first of all, tell us where we can uh, get double negative uh, online. Yeah, so the easiest place, you know, would be you can buy it on Amazon, um, but you can also buy it from Duke University Press, which is the publisher. Um, Barnes & Noble, like anywhere where you can buy a book, uh, uh, you can get it online. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, now the last thing I want to end with, and um, and I said this before we started recording, and I'll say it again. Um, I don't care who you are. I, I'm a firm believer, and, and I don't. I'm not in the business of offering a lot of opinions on doing these because I don't think it's my job or my place. But one thing I will always say is that Black History Month is for everyone, no matter mm -hmm. what color you are, no matter where you come from. It really is a time to celebrate, like you said, achievements that have gone uh have gone underappreciated. Things of uh, inventors, educators. Um, uh, entrepreneurs that really never got their just due for whatever reason, uh, but they, they really have gone under the radar and they need to be celebrated. And black mm -hmm. culture is part of American culture and everyone needs to uh, at least be familiar with it and, and realize the contributions that have been made. And with these kids about to graduate from high school and make those college decisions and get into the real world and see the way that they may or may not be portrayed because of things in the media or things on social media, television, film, what can they do now to start getting ready for that as they take that next step in life? That's a really big question. Um, okay. Hmm. You know, I, okay. I like to think of it in terms of you always need to know where home is, <laughs> like figure out what it, there, there's a thing, there's a sense of self, there's a sense of what you want to do and who you, I, I think of it in terms of who do you want to be in the world? Um, not like, what can you do? Or like, what, like, I don't mean it from a, like, from a job perspective, but like, who do you want to be in the world? Who do you want to be to people? You know, for me, I want to be a professor that hopefully inspires my students to go out and, and make their best work and be their best selves. I want to be a professor that when they're in my classroom, they feel like they're at home. They feel like they're comfortable, regardless of, of where they come from, regardless if if they're similar to me or not. Like I always want them to feel like my classroom is a, is a safe space. Those are my core things. And so everything I do, I try, it has to emanate from that. And when I feel myself going in a direction that is not that, then I, I'm like, no, 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 where's like, where's home? Where's like North, right? Where's like the North Star? Like get back to that. For me, that's a thing that I wish I had kind of known when I was a teenager, right? That you have to have this sense um, of like, where home is for for yourself and who you're who you want to be in the world um and i feel like if you can kind of like identify that then it just provides a nice compass whenever you start getting distracted and so i'll give you an example i mean we talked about these media appearances ultimately i want to produce really good scholarly work i do i want to i want when you know when when you all go to college i want you to read my articles in a class and i want you to feel like they're useful right so what that means is like sometimes when you get a couple of media appearance invitations and I'm like, 
yeah, but my research is falling behind that it's hard because it's fun to be on T it's fun to be able to send clips to your friends, you know, to your parents. Um, my parents don't know what I do. Right. But I can send them like something from Netflix and they get it. <laughs> what that means is that as exciting as that is, sometimes I turn stuff down because I actually have to do like the thing that I know I'm supposed to be doing, like my research and my teaching. Right. Um, but knowing that that's, who I want to be in the world, it makes those decisions not not easy, but it makes them clear. Um, and I think that that's a thing um, that's really important to take through you as you kind of go through life. I love it. And again, everybody needs to watch Stamp from the Beginning on Netflix. Very mm -hmm. eye-opening. But uh, Dr. Raquel Gates, thank you so much. Columbia University, all the way from Brooklyn, New York, for joining us today. Really, really enjoy this. And I hope everyone can really celebrate not only today, but every day, Black History Month always. So thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. It was great to meet you. Talk to you later, my friend. Bye. Yeah.